So Dr. Judith Curry is president and co-founder of the Climate Forecast Applications Network, CFAN. She is Professor Morella at the Georgia Institute of Technology, where she served as chair of Earth and Atmospheric Services for uh, Sciences for 13 years. Her expertise is in climate dynamics, extreme weather, and prediction predictability. Um, Dr. Curry is a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Geophysical Union. Uh, Geophysical Union. She is a recipient of the Henry J. Hooten Research Award and the, from the American Meteorological Society. Um, Dr. I, I could go on and on and on uh, with your credentials, but I, I want to first plug that you know you are also the author of. Uh, the book Climate Uncertainty and Risk, uh, which is now number two on Amazon's list for climate um, publications. And I will just read a, a quote that I saw yesterday about um, from a reviewer of her book. Climate Uncertainty and Risk is more than a book. Curry has produced a single author counter to the IPCC that offers a radical alternative to the UN paradigm of climate change. So Dr. Curry, welcome here today. Well, thank you. So I, I just want to first start with your book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. I'm going to start with the title of that book. And I want to read you a few statements by some of our political leaders. The UN Secretary General has pleaded for immediate radical action on climate change and said we're entering into an era of global boiling. He described the recent IPCC report as code red for humanity. The, ICC, uh, the IPCC report summary said... There's a rapidly closing window of opportunities to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. President mm -hmm. Biden has said, and I heard this yesterday as well, that climate change is an existential threat. Our governor has said that climate change is here and we have no choice but to aggressively pursue bold actions to address uh, the crisis. And our commissioner of environmental protection has said that climate change is the single greatest threat to our way of life in New Jersey and is wrecking havoc across the globe. So. I'm not hearing a lot of uncertainty in any of those statements, and they are clearly stating that the risk is imminent and substantial. Um, how would you respond to those statements? Well, these statements from our political leaders reflect overt political bias and uninformed certainty. Look, people bought into the climate change issue since they assumed it was based on good data and science. However, this apocalyptic messaging has greatly diverged from the actual scientific foundation and its uncertainties. My book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk, describes how badly we have mischaracterized climate risk. First, our political leaders have vastly oversimplified both the climate change problem and its solutions. They've allowed a single policy solution of eliminating emissions to frame both the scientific problem and the risk from climate change. Natural climate variability is all but ignored and warming is assumed to be dangerous. They've conflated the incremental risks from the slow creep of warming with the emergency risks of extreme weather events, which have little to do with the warming. And they fail to recognize that what has been cast as a global crisis is for the most part thousands of local vulnerability emergencies that are revealed by extreme weather events, such as the recent crumbling dams in Libya and the flooding in New York City. So let's go over some basics before we get to some of the solutions that you, know, you outline in your book. We hear that climate change is settled and um, the science of climate science is settled and there's a 90%, 97% consensus. We also see news stories nightly that climate change is causing fires, droughts, hurricanes, the floods in New York, and almost every extreme weather event. Can you explain what we know and what we do not know about human impacts on the climate? And what role does natural variability play in climate change? And uh, what can um, what man-made impacts on the climate are we seeing now? Well, here are the unquestioned facts about global warming. Average global surface temperature has increased since about 1860. Carbon dioxide has infrared emission spectra and thus acts to warm the planet. Humans have been adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere via emissions from burning fossil fuels. Mm 
But we now know enough to reject the UN's extreme emission scenarios for the 21st century as extremely unlikely. However, there's disagreement and uncertainty about the most consequential issues, whether warming from emissions has dominated over natural climate variability as the cause of the recent warming, how the climate will change over the course of the 21st century, and whether warming is dangerous. The weakest part of the UN argument is that warming is dangerous. There's little danger associated with the slow creep of global warming some sea level rise and melting of glaciers that started around 1860. In some regions, warming would clearly be advantageous, such as Canada, Russia, Northern China. And the planet has overall been greening with the increased CO2 in the atmosphere. For those of you who are my age and older, you may recall that for the past 50 years, the global weather has been fairly benign. In the US, the weather was much worse in the 1930s. Heat waves, droughts, fires, and even landfalling hurricanes in the 1930s were much worse than anything we've experienced in the 21st century. Natural climate variability associated with ocean circulation patterns dominates the decadal scale occurrence of extreme weather events. The IPCC, UN climate assessments acknowledge that there's little evidence that global warming is worsening extreme weather events, apart from heat waves. Any signal from global warming is very difficult to discern against the background of natural climate variability. So if there exists significant uncertainty on the impacts of CO2, how much warming we're experiencing, whether warming is even harmful, and if the IPCC has even limited the upper range of warming and determined that most natural disasters cannot be linked to climate change, why aren't we hearing that? Well, there's some complex social and political dynamics in play here. This issue is addressed in part one of my book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. Back in the 1980s and early 90s, the UN set us on this path to prevent dangerous human-caused climate change by reducing emissions. This was well before we understood very much about the science or the socioeconomic implications. Naively thinking that humans could control the climate, the UN framed both the climate change problem and its solutions as irreducibly global. Their solution of eliminating greenhouse gas emissions requires a global response. So they assumed that an overwhelming consensus among the world scientists was required to accomplish this. So what evolved was a politically motivated, manufactured scientific consensus on climate change that downplays natural variability and uncertainties. Over time, political, financial, and even scientific interests became aligned in supporting the UN agenda. And the public messaging strategy has been one of trying to alarm the public in their efforts to urge action on eliminating fossil fuel emissions. Substantial efforts are made to marginalize and cancel scientists who challenge this narrative of alarm. And all of this has been amplified by the media. Climate media has become big business. 10 years ago, there were only a handful of journalists on the climate beat. Now, each major media outlet has dozens of reporters covering climate. The end result of all this is international policies and national commitments that don't seem justified, doable, or politically feasible. So, you know, we have a conference here today that is being driven by uh, largely but by policy related to uh, these facts. Uh, it's, it's being driven by deadlines, established international agreements and laws. Uh, targets have been set either at 1.5 or, or 2 degrees Celsius, and dates for uh, net zero emissions have been set either at 2035 here in New Jersey or 2050 you know, in, in other agreements. What is the scientific basis for these limits and deadlines? And what happens if we don't meet those targets? Is there a downside for setting firm limits for decarbonization? Well, there's no scientific validity of these temperature targets as thresholds for danger 
The baseline for these temperature targets is the second half of the 19th century, just after the end of the Little Ice Age, which was the coldest period of the last thousand years. And temperatures have already warmed by about 1.2 degrees Celsius since this cold baseline period, or about two degrees Fahrenheit. The IPCC did not have direct input into this temperature target. Most scientists treat these targets as a political issue. Simply put, the two degree limit is used politically to motivate the urgency of action to reduce CO2 emissions and to create maximum pressure for action. Natural climate variability will play a big role in determining when and if global temperatures cross the two degree threshold. Look, the slow creep of another one degree of warming isn't going to be any worse than the slow creep of warming that we saw during the 20th century. We've adapted to this warming with greater agricultural productivity, fewer people in poverty, and fewer lives lost from extreme weather events. The global number of deaths from weather and climate disasters has decreased by 98% over the past 100 years. And finally, these targets encourage goal displacement by focusing on hitting the target. As a result, we're obscuring the real reason why we're concerned about climate change in the first place, the well-being of humans and ecosystems. The focus on infeasible policy proposals for climate stabilization is impeding more productive policy action on climate change. And this is not to mention the opportunity cost of not dealing with more urgent societal problems. So if the impacts from greenhouse gas emissions are uncertain in time and impact, but the harm can be potentially great, why not just follow the precautionary principle and stop using fossil fuels by 2030, as many are advocating? <laughs> Chapter 10 in my book. Mm -hmm. um, the precautionary principle identifies climate change it's a serious enough problem to justify some response. However, it doesn't provide any guidance on the appropriate magnitude of the response or the best actions. The possibility for great harm from global warming has been drastically reduced over the past two years. In 2021, the UN Conference of Parties dropped the most extreme emission scenarios, finally acknowledging that they were implausible. These extreme emission scenarios produce four to five degrees warming by 2100 and the most alarming impacts. These extreme scenarios are now off the table with the UN working with an expected warming of about 2.4 degrees by 2100. This has cut the perceived risk in half from what it was only a few years ago. So why not follow the precautionary principle anyways and stop using fossil fuels by 2030 or whatever your deadline? Well, the precautionary principle blinds us to many aspects of risk-related situations. The precautionary... Dr. Curry, can you hear us? You just froze. Sorry? Can you hear me? Uh, now we can. Okay, sorry. You, uh, you, you, uh, you froze me to start talking about uh, the precautionary principle. Um, why not stop by 2030? Okay. Well, the precautionary principle is about avoiding possible harm. It, but it ignores a wider set of values, such as an easier life, greater health, innovation, and economic prosperity. The rapid transition of electric power systems away from fossil fuels using wind and solar is introducing substantial new risks to electric power systems, including less reliable and more expensive electricity. Continuing on this path will hamper development, advancement, and broader sustainability efforts if we try to do this too quickly. We're seeing this play out right now in Germany, Africa, and many parts of the world. Under conditions of deep uncertainty, the precautionary principle and associated targets is not the only way to frame the decision-making problem. 
Risk management has many tools that can be applied to complex, ambiguous, and deeply uncertain problems such as climate change. These are described in part three of my book, Climate Uncertainty and Risk. So in your book, given everything you've just said, you call for a reset of our climate and energy policies. Can you explain what you mean by that? Okay. Um, first, we need to recognize some inconvenient truths about climate risk. We need to recognize that risks from climate change are fundamentally local. And these risks are inextricably entwined with. Again, you just froze, so we'll hopefully you'll unfreeze in a second. From climate change are fundamentally local. These risks are inextricably entwined with natural climate variability land use and societal vulnerabilities, including poor governance. Blaming weather catastrophes on human-caused climate change deflects from the real causes of our vulnerabilities. Climate variability and change should be regarded as an ongoing predicament that we should seek to better understand and manage its impacts. Next, we need to recognize some inconvenient truths about climate and energy policies. Understanding and managing climate risk is extremely challenging in the face of system complexity, deep uncertainties, and political disagreements. The vast majority of people believe that climate change is a real problem. However, many fear a future with, without cheap, abundant fuel and continued economic expansion far more than they fear climate change. My biggest concern is that the urgency of meeting net zero targets is causing us to make bad choices about future energy systems. Widespread implementation of wind and solar power is impairing grid resiliency and reliability. This makes us more vulnerable during periods of cold and heat extremes. It's also generating some big conflicts about land and coastal ocean use and concerns about ecosystems and even species extinction. Yes, we should seek to lower emissions as low as reasonably practical. However, even if we somehow reach net zero by 2050, we won't notice any change in the climate before the 22nd century. And this is because of the background of natural climate variability. We need to abandon the idea that we can control the climate and bad weather by eliminating emissions. Even if human-caused climate change is somehow eliminated, natural climate variability and inevitable surprises will provide ongoing challenges. These will require continuing adaptation by communities. So what should policymakers do? Well, once we recognize these inconvenient truths, there's space for better managing climate risk. A pragmatic approach to managing climate risk recognizes that it's often far easier to agree on specific solutions or policies than it is to agree on the causes of the problems. Most people can agree on the overall strategies of energy innovation and building resilience to extreme weather. Both of these strategies have many benefits, independent of human-caused climate change. Climate, pragma climate pragmatism recommends moving away from global top-down approaches in favor of breaking the problem into smaller, human-relevant problems and solutions. Climate pragmatism prioritizes no regrets policies by avoiding policy options with controversial, uncertain, or immeasurable benefits. Um, the long time horizons of both climate impacts and developing technologies are best handled by adaptive risk management. This includes learning from trial and error and incorporating changes in the technologies and knowledge base over time. Specifically with regards to energy systems. Yes, CO2 emissions are a problem and should be reduced. 
but not as an urgent problem that trumps the energy needs of the global population. This, co excuse me, this conflict can be resolved by relaxing the time horizon for reducing CO2 emissions while maintaining energy abundance, reliability, and affordability throughout the energy transition. In evaluating different sources of electric power, a holistic evaluation is needed of all relevant factors, such as life cycle costs of power production, transmission, and the required infrastructure, land use requirements and material use, abundance and reliability of electric power, plus life cycle environmental impacts, including CO2 emissions, but not just the cost of power production and CO2 emissions, which seems to be dominating this whole discussion. There's growing realization that 21st century warming will not be nearly as bad as previously thought. So the political narrative is shifting too, but the impacts are worse than we thought. Well, this shift in perception of 21st century climate change and its risks argues for prioritizing adaptation over emissions reductions. But this is exactly the opposite of what's happening. So in your book, you also use the phrase and have advocated for human well-being and flourishing and that they should be at the center of our climate and energy policies. What do you mean by that? And aren't our current policies intended to enhance human well-being? There's growing support for a climate politics that harnesses enlightened self-interest rather than focusing on austerity and telling people what they can't do. This plays to the objectives of human flourishing and thriving. People need abundant food, water, energy, and materials to thrive. The UN has presupposed a moral obligation to control climate change by imposing net zero emissions. In doing so, they bypass the moral dilemma of possibly preventing future harm from climate change versus helping currently living humans. We can't predict what the world will be like in 2100, including likely losses from human caused climate change. Therefore, sacrificing the well being of the current global population by restricting energy access seems neither moral nor just. Africa is the chief victim here. Development and resilience in underdeveloped countries is being slowed down by linking international development funds to reducing emissions. Yeah. This emphasis on reducing emissions comes at the expense of development funds that have historically been targeted for poverty reduction. It's well recognized that economic development is our best hope for adapting to climate change. These net zero policies are slowing down human development and causing all sorts of problems for Africa. And this is just totally contrary to the UN sustainable development goals. Now, everyone would benefit, both now and in the future, from being better prepared for the extreme weather and climate risks that we're already facing, such as investment in water storage in drought-prone regions and, protect and protection against flooding in urban areas and better disaster management protocols. Unlike mitigation of CO2 emissions with little benefit in the 21st century, Adaptation and increased resilience to extreme weather events helps people thrive both now and in the future. Uh, Dr. Curry, thank you for that perspective. Is there anything else that um, I did not ask you that you know um, you want to comment on? And uh, more importantly, where could people find your book? Okay, well, my book can be found at Amazon.com and many other online retailers. Um, I listened to part of your conference. My main advice to, to New Jersey is to hang on to your nuclear power mm -hmm. and you're probably gonna need more. Um, so I, I know it's a big challenge, you know, what you're trying to do, but be open to wind and solar not working out because I've been following what's going on very closely in South Australia, which is 
maybe farther along than anybody in terms of trying to do this all from wind and solar. And the costs and the challenges are very, very substantial. So um, there's a big learning curve um, in terms of trying to get to new zero. And I hope your politicians <laughs> will stop worrying about the targets and slow things down a bit so you can make the best possible decisions. I should also mention that you have a, a blog that I've been following for your climate, et cetera. So people could, could follow you and could follow um, uh, the authors who you bring into that site. So uh, Dr. Curry, I, I thank you very much for being here and offering that perspective. Hey, thank you.